Hello, my name is Eileen Orr. I'm a program specialist for Exceptional Student Education Division for St. Lucie County Public Schools. Today we're going to be discussing some effective instructional strategies that work with diverse learners. All students can benefit when teachers use effective instructional practices. This presentation describes general techniques and strategies for instruction that have been proven to be effective with diverse groups of learners, students with disabilities, students with limited English proficiency, and other students who are at risk for failure in school can benefit when teachers use these strategies. These practices are drawn from a broad base of research and investigation, most of which has come from the Florida Department of Education and the, uh, um, the, not, the book Effective Teaching Strategies that Accommodate diverse learners. Effective instructional strategies. First, let's talk about what is an instructional strategy. It's a method that, that's used in the lesson to ensure the sequence or delivery of instruction that helps students learn. Effective is the student performance improves when the instructional strategies are used. The first strategy that we're going to discuss is focus on essentials. What is essential for all students to know or be able to do after this lesson? It's important for us to identify the important principles, the key concepts, and the big ideas. The technique of, of identifying the big ideas is when instruction is organized around major themes that run through a subject area which helps students make connections between concepts and helps bridge their thinking to higher level skills. Graphic organizes is a very good strategy or technique to use. It's laying important ideas out graphically to help students see the connections between ideas. Those were illustration of graphic organizers, but for some reason they're not showing up here. You can Google graphic organizers and there's many free samples that you can download. Another technique is thematic instruction. Lessons and assignments are coordinated across classes to make themes and essential concepts more evident and meaningful for the students. There's infusion, one subject area integrated with another. There's parallel instruction, subjects taught separately, but a common theme is developed in different subject areas. This is commonly used in the middle schools. Multidisciplinary instruction. It's a common concept or theme is addressed in different subject areas and a joint assignment or projects links the subjects together. And then there's transdisciplinary instruction. Two or more subject areas address the common concept totally integrated. Planning routines are very important when teachers are planning their lessons. Systematic routines that include graphic organizers to help you plan units and lessons around the big ideas and it helps students monitor their learning. The second strategy is to make linkages obvious and explicit. As you are teaching, actively help students understand how key concepts across the curriculum relate to each other. Many times we need to do this for students. Our explanations need to be very clear and using visual displays to illustrate the key concepts and the relationships benefits students. Visual displays such as flowcharts, diagrams, graphic organizers. 
assist students in developing their skills of outlining or mind mapping so that they can demonstrate the connections among concepts. The third crucial strategy is priming background knowledge. Connect new information or skills to what students have already learned. For those students who lack background knowledge, provide additional instruction or support. It's easier for students to understand new concepts if they can connect it to something they already know. And we need to prompt the relevant background knowledge by asking the students specific questions. Make concept <clears throat> comparisons between the new concepts and the concepts that the student already knows. Choose events familiar to the student and relate the new topic to it. Another technique is to relate the concept to a fictional story that the students are familiar with and use instructional materials that provide easy access to critical background knowledge. The fourth strategy is to provide temporary support for learning. It's important to provide support while students are learning the new skills, gradually decreasing the level of support as students move toward mastery or a higher degree of independence. A technique is scaffolding, temporary support that is provided while new skills are being learned and faded as students reach mastery. Remind the students through verbal and or written prompts what are the key concepts. If necessary, physically assist or guide a student. Provide study or note-taking guides to support learning from text to lectures. Use mnemonics to help students remember things. One that I remember from school is HOMES. And the first letter of the word HOMES stands for one of the Great Lakes. Tell students what they are expected to learn. Provide starters or incomplete statements for students to finish so that they can develop the concepts and the skills. Identify for the students in between tasks that will guide the students toward independence. Some students need to be expl explicitly told what the steps are. Give students an outline or a study guide a diagram or a graphic organizer. Use structured patterns of plans to help students learn. Another strategy or technique would be to use oral reading and frequent questions to help students process material from the textbooks. Many struggling learners find it difficult to just read a textbook and gain the information from it that we need them to. So by questioning, little chunking the information, students benefit greatly. Identify the page numbers where topics can be found. Remind students what they are to do by using verbal and or written prompts. Use peer tutoring or cooperative learning to provide extra support for those students who need it. Incorporate activities that provide guided practice for the students before they are expected to use the concepts independently. The fifth strategy 
is to use conspicuous steps and strategies. Teach students to follow a specific set of procedures or steps to use for a particular process or to solve problems. Model the steps using a think aloud process. Let the students hear how your mind goes through the steps. Name the specific strategy and prompt the student to use it, fading the prompting as students become more proficient in using it. Again, use mnemonics to help students recall the steps. Prompt students to use the strategy during practice activities, which is why it's important to name the strategy so you can encourage and prompt students to use the particular strategy that will help them with the task at hand. Explicitly teach students the organizational structure of text and prompt its use. And the sixth strategy is to give students many opportunities to practice and receive feedback on their performance to ensure that knowledge is retained and can be applied in different situations. Many of us skip this step. This is crucial. Students need time to practice and they need feedback from us. Use multiple reviews of concepts and skills. Give students specific feedback on what they're doing well or what they need to change. Give students enough practice to master the skills. And some students need more practice than others. And we need to, to realize that and offer those, offer those that need more practice the time to do it. Review skills over time to ensure mastery is maintained. Reinforce the generalization of knowledge by providing reviews in different contexts. Provide cumulative reviews that address content learned throughout the whole year. Questions that we need to reflect on as educators. How can I change my teaching style to meet the challenges of diversity among my learners? Do I anticipate problems a student with a disability or a struggling learner may have with my instructional methods or assessment activities. What can I change? Instructional methods and materials, assignments and assessments, time demands and schedule, the learning environment I've created, special communication systems. When we're planning instruction or accommodations or differentiating activities, we need to look at the input. Can the student learn from the same kinds of instruction and materials as his or her classmates? So you're thinking about the struggling learner in your class, the student with a disability, possibly, children who are, who are not English proficient. If not, then how can the student successfully acquire the information and skills to be learned? What can I do differently for this learner? Then we need to look at the output. Can the student participate in the lessons, produce what is necessary, and be assessed in the same way as other classmates? If not, how can the student successfully participate and be assessed? What can I do differently for this learner? The rate. Can the student work as fast as the rest of the class? Does, does the student need the same amount of feedback and practice? If not, how can I change the schedule of feedback and practice opportunities for this learner.
support. Can the student manage independent and group work as well as his or her classmates? If not, then the question we should ask is what adjustments can I make? When we're planning and when we're teaching, we need to have a self-reflection or self-evaluation process going on in our minds. It is possible that providing effective instructional strategies or accommodations or differentiation for struggling students or students with disabilities may mean that we will need to change the way we teach and test students. There is no single method of accommodating or differentiating for learners. It happens as a result of thinking about how we teach, how each student learns best, and then providing the means for all to be successful. Thank you.